Greetings, folks, and welcome to the live launch party for the Nookie Nomicon, Bawdy Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. I'm Tim Mendes. I'm one of the authors in this. I'm also your host for the evening. Uh, in a moment, I will bring on some guests. Uh, we are having some weird sort of, like, trouble, <laughs> internet-related issues at the minute. Like, people keep popping in and popping out. But So we're just going to muddle through anyway. Yeah, so the Nookie Nomicon is out today from Red Cape Publishing. And here's the proof copy. Look at that. Look at that for a sexy beast of a book. Now, it will also be available in a hardback. And I can't wait to get my hands on a hard copy. <laughs> Matron. Righty ho. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring everybody on uh, and introduce them. And then we're going to do some readings. And then there will be some time for questions afterwards. So if you have any questions for for us lot, get them down in the comments section and we'll go through them in a bit. Righty ho, my first guest uh, is currently, he's originally a, a scouser, you know, uh, he now resides in the Netherlands, uh, but before I bring him on, I have to just, you know, I just have to do this every time me and him are together on a stream. Right ho, the first guest is Callum Pierce. Hello, matey. How are you doing? <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> yeah, it's good to get the warning up early. Like Isn't know it? What they're in for. Exactly. How are you doing then, mate? Fabulous. A bit warm now, but <laughs> oh, it is a bit. It is a bit, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like <laughs> you're like me, aren't you? Just not built for heat. No, no, yeah. not at all. Nah. Sun is not my bag at all. <laughs> oh god, I can't be doing with it. No. Then I don't like winter. I'm just a moaning bitch. Whatever, whatever, <laughs> whatever the weather, I'll find something no, I... to complain about. <laughs> I like it. I do actually quite like it cold. I, I'm, I'm a weird person. I, I'm yeah, I prefer it. I, I like yeah. autumn. That's my kind of time. Oh, yes. Yeah, now it's you're talking. Lovely. Now you're talking. I like yeah, a good yeah. warm autumn, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> Righty-ho, uh, our second guest, uh, he's sort of... He, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'll start that. Again. <laughs> our second guest uh, is... He happens to be a co-host uh, with myself of the Innsmouth Book Club podcast and a new podcast uh, devoted to Clark Ashton Smith called Strange Shadows. He is also a musician, so don't ask him about the size of his organ. Uh, we bring on Mr. Robert Poynton. Hello, sir. Hello, folks. <laughs> Hello. Very nice to be here. Thank you. I do like a warm hand on my entrance, so I think I'm in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> you might get more than that here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems <looking up. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you nearly made me put that in your bio, didn't you? Did I? Oh, he did also you? has a big organ. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, you know, one doesn't like to but I like to slip it in wherever I can, you know. No. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Righty ho, uh, our third guest of the evening is, is a, I believe she's in a car park somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> now, Beth W. Patterson. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? I'm great. I am indeed in a car park. Um, and even weirder is that my steering wheel is on the left side and the passenger, you know, so <laughs> yes, that's, yes. that's something weird for you guys right there. And yes. yeah, I have, it's 3 p.m. local time where I'm, I'm just outside the D.C. area and I have a gig tonight. So I just showed up early, grabbed a spot and uh, conducting the, uh, the live stream from the car park at the venue. Nice. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. I feel kind of uh, dirty doing it in the car. <laughs> yeah, I know. it's funny because I said that earlier. I believe Beth's gonna be doing it from a car, and they're like, "Oh, I'm totally, <laughs> I'm totally doing it from." A, and also, you know, I, I, because I'm a musician myself, and my husband is also a keyboard player, so he has yeah. a sizable organ. But because we're talking about Cthulhu, he has currently has about twenty sizable organs. And, uh, nice, <laughs> nice, brilliant. <laughs> so right, ask me why I'm smiling. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> now we did have Chris Hewitt, but he seems to have vanished. Now, like we said, yeah, he's vanished. It was like we said, we did have some. Uh, he is having some um, internet issues, so I'm assuming he's going to pop back in later at some point. Um, uh, snarf, right. Snarf. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's started already. <laughs> snarf. Snarf. 
Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Start as you mean to go on. Right. Uh, for what you uh, want to get hold of a copy of the book, there is some links in the comments section, which will be underneath the video as you're watching. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, and you can also get it on Godless. It's just gone live on there as well. So click them links, and you'll be uh, good to go. Now, just before we uh, get into the readings, I just want to show off the cover a little bit. I showed you the proof copy, but um, that's the full <laughs> wrap. <laughs> the sexy looking cover, isn't it? That's uh, so I think that's so going to look pretty. awesome. Yeah, it's going to look awesome in the hardback, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like. Oh, yeah. I can't, can't wait to get my hands on the hard one. No. Um, <laughs> I can't wait, guys. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're going to start off with the readings and we'll just go round the. Round the th round the horn. There we go. <laughs> As you do, uh, Callum, are you good to start, mate? I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> you like to get it out the way early. Oh, hang That's on, you, hang right. on. He's back. Well, in here he is. Oh yeah. Quick before he vanishes again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the Garden of England, there is Kent, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chris Hewitt. How That's are you doing? Up on laptop. <laughs> oh right. Okay. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers okay. crossed. Yeah, yeah. How are you doing then, matey? Parker. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what Virgin's got to say about it. Excellent. Right. Okay, then. Callum, are you good to go for the first yes. reading? Sir? Right. I'll take you all off. I'll bring you all back on very shortly. All right, matey, go for it. Okay, dokie. <laughs> Oh, I suppose I should say it's with a group of um, mature students, very mature well, and immature. Um, and they're off on a kind of trip to uh, visit some caves that used to be used by a cult. Um, so this is where they're on the coach and uh, Tig Bitties, I'm very sorry, <laughs> is drifting off to sleep. Her dreams were strange and disjointed. One moment she was floating in the vast, soul-sucking vacuum of space. Her body remained together, but she felt as though her memories and personality were being pulled in a million directions. For those moments, she felt as though she was living in a million bodies at once. She could remember lives that she hadn't lived. She could smell the decaying corpses around her in wars that she'd never fought in. Before she could fully, fully grasp any of the tendrils of the, these memories, she fe felt cold, wet hair hitting her in the face. Um, when she closed her eyes, those memories were gone. She could almost feel them drifting away from her body like the frayed edges of a dream when you're waking up. She wanted to reach out and grab them back. Opening her eyes, she found herself standing alone in a dark, cold cave. In front of her was a deep pit. There seemed to be splashes of blood against the rocks at the side. And at the bottom of the pit, she could see what looked like large tentacles writhing and folding over each other. For a moment, there was a flash of a giant mouth filled with pointed teeth, closing together as more tentacles slithered to cover it. Large bloodshot eyes opened all along each tentacle and blinked at her. I have seen your final moments. The voice traveled up from the pit to Tig's ears. As terrified as she was, she still couldn't help but find the list distracting. I can already taste your sacrifice. Taste me what? Tig gasped. The terror had already transformed into deep concentration as she was trying to figure out what the voice was trying to tell her. Oh, sacrifice. <laughs> the blood of your party will summon me to the great feast. Great feast? Tig was getting the hang of this now. The end of the universe as you know it. The voice lisped. Chaos, confusion, conflicts. Tig laughed out loud and then felt instantly guilty. She ran the words back through her head a couple of times until she'd worked out what the voice had been trying to say. Concentrating so hard it made her miss the giant tentacle that was creeping up the side of the pit towards her. It dived up the last part quickly and wrapped around her waist and stomach, pushing her breasts up under her chin. The feast begins with you, the voice said. Here, let me go, Tig shouted through her rising breasts. 
Tig. Was that Anita's voice shouting in the distance? Tig, wake up, we're there. Tig felt the strength of the tentacles evaporate and her breasts flop down to where they belonged. Her eyes flicked open and she squinted to adjust to the daylight filling the coach. I must have dropped off, she mumbled. Dropped off? You've been snoring like an old sow for the last two hours, Dick laughed. He was standing in the aisle trying to get his overstuffed backpack out of the rack above his seat. Here, there's only one dirty old swine on this bus, Dick, and it ain't me. The dream was already leaving her except for the image of the creature at the bottom of the pit. The tentacles still writhed and wriggled in her mind. The eyes still glared at her hungrily. Yeah, and that's your lot. That's all you're getting. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's when you claim when you when you sort of flipped into the uh, the Tig voice. It just <laughs> come on. <laughs> just... Brilliant. <laughs> nice one, sir. Yeah, I was going to add one to them. Hang on. Where is it? <laughs> but I nice. thought that was a bit much. <laughs> Don't want to over egg the pudding, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to ask you at the beginning what's yours called? Oh, um, a nasty little cult. <laughs> go on, there we go. Nice one, matey. Uh, yeah, it was going to be sweet sacrifice, wasn't it, to fuck with people's heads? <laughs> <laughs> it it, it looked like a typo on the comments. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Uh, yep, there you go. Doing great. There you uh, go. Your husband, yeah. me little yeah. orbit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so all you people watching, if you have any questions for Callum or myself or anybody else, get them down. It'll probably get very silly later. You have been warned. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Bring on our next our next reader. It's a. Uh, oh, where's he gone? There he is. It's Mister Poynton. Greetings, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Yeah. Um. So my story is called the Tower of the Toad or Carry On Colon based yep. on a certain uh, Robert E. Howard character who people will probably be able to guess very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, the section I'm reading, I'll, I'll give you the cast list because I can't really do the voices. Uh, Colon is Jim Dow. Nick Knack is Bernard Breslau. Blue Sonia is Babs Windsor. And the innkeeper is Peter Butterworth. So bear that in mind. <laughs> nice. It's like you know, reading yours. It was like it had that sort of um, like the carry on Cleo kind of vibe, you know, the historicals they did, you know, with yes. Jim Dale. Yeah. Yeah. So I see where you, I see exactly where you were going with that. So it just seemed a perfect mashup. Robert E. Howard and the carry on team. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah totally. You know. I don't know why it's never been done. <laughs> it's just like, this is it, isn't it? Exactly. Right then, matey. I'll leave you to it. <laughs> okay. The Tower of the Toad. Colon the Barbarian grimaced and once again adjusted the heft of his weapon. The fern nappy was a snug fit and more than a little itchy. He tilted his face skyward to take in the full height and girth of the structure before him. Its glossy shaft thrust up proudly into the evening sky, the plum-hued dome at its top glistening in the last rays of the setting sun. The Tower of the Toad, men called it, though few knew why and even less cared. Regardless, Colon was here to thieve its riches. He was a young man, black page boy haircut, framing a youthful face. His body was lean and angular and he moved with an inbuilt clumsiness, quite often bumping into furniture or tripping over his own feet. But lust burned in his heart. Lust for two things, the great treasure hoard rumoured to be within the tower and the statuesque form of the wizard's assistant. Even as he thought of her, the pulse pounded in his temples and he was forced to pause for another readjustment. His mind cast back to the first time he saw that vision of loveliness. Get out of my way, idiot! The florid-faced man snarled as Colon bumped into him. Colon apologised and turned, tripping over the stall of the trader behind him. Knickknacks fell into the mud. Oi! What's your game? The stallholder bellowed, gesticulating. He was a tall man, almost a giant, thick brows knitting beneath a balding pate. Colon began hurriedly picking up the items. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Do forgive me. I'll, I'll, I'll pick them up. He gathered a handful and straightened, banging his head on the underside of the stool. Placing the pieces of carefully crafted tack back into place, he introduced himself. I'm Colon, from the north. I'm new in town. The stallholder glanced at the outstretched hands. You don't say. 
Well, accidents happen, I suppose. He shook the proffered hand. I'm Nick. Nick Knack. Colon raised an eyebrow. Nick Knack? Yes. The man placed beefy fists on hips. And you sell Nick Knacks? I do. Nick's brows were knitted again. Of course, something to say about it. No, 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 no. Colon attempted a hearty chuckle. It's, it's lovely, very nice. The fists uncurled. Well, that's all right then. Tell you what, trade is quiet today. Let's nip into the Queen's legs over the road. You can buy me a drink. Colon glanced over his shoulder at the shabby looking inn. Oh, is the Queen's legs open then? Nick gave him a leer. Well, you'd have to ask the King, wouldn't you? Guffawing heartily, the two new friends crossed the muddy, reeking street to the tavern beyond. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> I've got to say, there's one line in yours that I that I, that I thought was absolute genius. It's the super calloused, fragile, mystic hex <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> How I long did say, it take you to come up with that? Oh no, I'd like to say I invented that, but I, I think I, I nicked that from somewhere. But, oh, uh, right. it, it just seemed to fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Excellent, sir. Nice one. Okay, uh, I will bring on the next our next guest. Beth, we're gonna, Hi. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get it from the car. Park. Hello from the car. Look, at least I'm still in the front seat. Um, yeah, you know, so <laughs> cut, me, cut me a little slack here. You know, yeah. only because I've got, you know, I've I've got three instruments and an amp and several suitcases in the back, so you know, yeah. you have to make two. Yeah, this uh, is it. You got to squeeze it where you can, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely, got to squeeze it. <laughs> you know, as you know, if you relax, it'll it'll take all the equipment. Yeah, that's um, it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So what, what's your story called then? Mine is called Lady Chatterley's Blowhole. Uh, <laughs> and the, you know, the, the thing is, of course, people think of Lady Chatterley as being sorted as it is, but we're talking yeah. about uh, about the proprietors of, uh, of an inn and uh, to this honeymooning couple. And they decide to save a little bit of money, so they take their honeymoon in Innsmouth. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> always a good idea. And, uh, Lady Chatterley is the proprietor who just won't shut up, and they're wondering, like, how does she even manage to breathe? You know, and, and uh, she just the chatter yeah, yeah. gives, you know, <laughs> makes them trance out and see visions. But uh, so they've just escaped, gotten out, just to snuck out of the room, out the window. There's always any added element of hilarity when when you have to sneak out a window. It's not important how I know this. And uh, so there's, there's the honeymoon couple. Well, we've couples. all been there, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, that, that was, so their names are, are Melvin and Fanny Futterbuck, uh, and uh, they're so they're wandering the town of uh, of Innsmouth. So nice. that's this, this scene right here. Cool. I'll leave you to it. All right. A long stroll through the town was anything but romantic. As they moved deeper into the heart of the residential area, the buildings seemed to have fallen into increasing amounts of disrepair. The old churches looked downright sinister. Many of the locals had what was referred to as the Innsmouth look, with large, unblinking eyes, wide, frog-like mouths, and narrow heads. They seemed outright hostile, but it was still better than the auditory assault of Lady Chatterley's jabbering. But when the newlyweds turned a corner, they encountered a new kind of Innsmouth denizens. Their heads were completely fish-like, unblinking eyes staring up at the trio. The shabby coats and trousers did little to conceal their running bodies grayish green skin. Melvin Futterbuck could not resist pulling his sketchbook from his coat pocket. What a vision, he crooned. Couldn't you be a bit more subtle, protested Fanny. I don't think they like being stared at, let alone being drawn. Why can't you carry a single page in, in case inspiration strikes? It's a leather-bound sketchbook. The pages are sewn into it. So I either whip it out right now or tear one off. One of them spoke in an intelligible croak. Avich, I look about we're not looking at anything, replied Fanny tightly. She tugged at her husband's sleeve. Darling, they appear to be getting hostile. I'm not asking for them to pose for me like French girls, snapped Melvin. This is going to be worse than Lady Chatterley's blowhole. The monstrous men suddenly approached. Rishuna, burbled one, and they began to approach the couple, loping into a gate that was somewhat, something between crawling and hopping. The Futterbucks tried to shuffle away as, at as brisk a pace as they could manage. The patter of webbed feet and the unmistakable sounds of hopping behind them drew nearer. The chase was on. Running along any streets parallel to the Manixer River seemed like a spectacularly bad idea. The pursuers appeared to be built for swimming, and there was no telling how many more might be hiding near their element. Look for a market, a shop, a fire station, panted Melvin. Any place, 
where people might help us. They're gaining on us. Why don't we overturn a fruit cart? Wailed Fanny. That's what they do in the movies. They turned a corner and found a dead end. The monstrous looking creatures blocked their escape. One wearing a gold circlet around his head and clad in long priestly robes, presumably their leader, made its way to the front of the throng. Flaring its gills, it opened its robe to expose itself and all that its infernal breeding had bestowed upon it. Well, isn't that just pervy, not to mention incredibly rude, remarked Melvin, still gasping for air. This explains why they weren't running just, just running by pedally, breathed Fanny. Is it normal for men to have five of those? Not human men, replied her husband. His trousers must fit him like a glove. Darling, are you disappointed? No, I'm still trying to figure out how to make them back off, snapped the young woman. Honey, give me your sketchbook. What are you... Now! Still in shock by the sum total of this morning's misadventures, Melvin handed his precious book to his spouse. She flipped it open to a blank page, then ripped out a sheet. Hey, protested the aspiring artist. I told you I wasn't going to tear one off in public. Ignoring her husband's annoyance, Fanny folded the sheet of paper into a tiny airplane, took aim, and launched it. The makeshift missile hit the fishy flasher squarely in one of its five nether appendages, causing the creature to let out a loud, loud squall. It curled up in a fetal position, buying time for the couple to grab more pages. The air was soon filled with tiny soaring paper aircrafts, reducing the monster to a confused mob. The Futterbucks pushed their way past the throng, pelted down the pathway called Fish Street, and didn't stop until they saw signs of commerce. <laughs> Nether appendages. <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Nice one. <laughs> so, you know, 20 organs, you know, is, is no big, you know, five yeah. appendages is no big deal when your husband has 20 organs. Yeah, that, oh, there you I'm go. Just, there that, you go. You know, <laughs> but it gave me a chance to use the punchline, his pants must fit him like a glove. Glove, yes. So. Yeah, yeah, perfect. <laughs> You've been waiting for something that you can use that for years, I, haven't like, you? All of my life, like ever since I, I probably heard that joke when I was 12 years old and I've been waiting all this time yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to use that well one. that's what this, this is all about all them jokes we've finally found the use for them <laughs> yeah yeah nice one i've got a, a love your deep one voice as well <laughs> go on go on give us a bit more of that that was brilliant <laughs> <laughs> i actually um found a translator they had a, a english to rely on uh yeah, translator. I, yeah. yeah so I know you know it. i was able to, to find things like uh open my star to your desires uh like like find until because <laughs> some of them don't translate you have to find words that already no. existed yeah in the lovecraft wheelhouse so I, I had to keep working until i could find something that translated every word so open my star to your desires or just what are you looking at uh, nice. <laughs> things like that so that's all Perfect. stuff that i looked up <laughs> that's another one for the weird um search history thing isn't it Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I, I shudder to think what my search history is going to look like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, okay. But cheers for that. I'll bring you back in a moment. Right. Let's bring on Chris. Hello, matey. Hey. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. So, I'm here. Your... still here, barring technical yeah. problems. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's your story they called then, sir? Uh, so my story is called the uh, Zan Sextet, and is essentially a sequel to the music of Eric Zan. And um, it has some of the the best <laughs> pun names I've ever heard. In it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think half the fun of these stories is just coming up with names. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Most of the time, the stories pretty much wrote themselves. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. So I did actually spend ages like looking, thinking of pun names that would fit. <laughs> into the, the, the yeah i think that yeah. took longer than actually writing the story <laughs> uh, right then okay. sir you Sorry. good to go yeah let's do it go for it okay so this is the san zan sextet it's stiff so make sure you push it right in hands bent over blushing i say now give the knob a good tug and a quick twist Blandot shoved his shoulder hard against the stubborn door. Once, twice, and the door flew open with a crack, sending the man stumbling into the dusty attic room. See? Nothing a bit of elbow grease went from fix. He retrieved the key from the rusty lock and handed it to his unimpressed new tenant. Hans stared down at his long nose, stared down his long nose at the boozy landlord, 
the funk of cheap wine and cheaper cigarettes turning his teetotal stomach. A shuttered window at the far end of the attic offered the only light filtered through a forest of cobwebs. Amongst the spider's gossamer tra tapestry, he could make out a rusty metal bedstead, washstand, bookcase and table, flanked by three rickety chairs. This can't have been my brother's room, said Hans, stepping over a desiccated rodent. No one's lived here for an age. I can assure you, these are your brother's lodgings. I guess he got behind on his dusting. Hans wrinkled his nose as he brushed aside the cobwebs, only for the sticky strands to cling to his frantically waving fingers. The dreary room seemed a squalid end for his brother. They hailed my brother, a Bratchen virtuoso, back in Deutschland. Easy for you to say. No one played the viola like Eric. He was the darling of countesses from Tits to Wankendorf. Blandot raised an eyebrow. No wonder the fella needed a break. Indeed. What? said Hans, uncertain if the Frenchman had understood him. Where are the rest of my brother's belongings? Blandot's tongue flicked across his wine-stained lips. Ah, about those. Your brother ran up sizable arrears, and he never mentioned any family, so I sold them. Sold them? What about his viola? Four francs at the pawn shop. Four francs? It's a priceless, priceless Stratovarius, owned by Lord Byron's granddaughter. I guess you must have dropped it. Hans stared at the buffoon, mouth agape. Rent is 400 francs a month, said Bardot, floorboards creaking as he picked his way through the filigree of filaments to the window. 400? I know, I'm mad to ask those little for a prestigious location on the Rue de Sul. But I liked your brother. He never gave me any bother, kept himself to himself. Bardot wrenched open the shutters, letting in the sepia daylight and awaking several irate bats that made a panic flapping exit. He gagged. Clutching hands gagged, clutching a handkerchief to his face to mask the putrid stench wafting from the oily dark river below. The open sewer snaked its way through the neighborhood, carrying the diabolic ditrius of countless Parisian households. 300, and I'll have the address of that pawn shop. Bardo looked to set to haggle until Hans produced the cash. Fine, fine. It'll be three months up front. Hans flared his nostrils again but counted out the money as Bardot's scribbled the receipt. And tax, we run a legitimate business here. Hans handed over the last of his money, wondering about the legitimacy of the baldy or baldy profile he'd passed on the first floor. Marvellous, Mr. Zan, said Bardot, counting the money. Hans stood tall, chest puffed out as he took the receipt. The name is Job. Eric was my half-brother. I'm a composer of some repute in Deutschland. Hans Job. You've no doubt heard of me. Lando furrowed his brow. I'm not really into Bavarian umper. Umper? Umper? Stick it up your jumper. That one of yours? What? No, I'm a classical composer. Shame, I like that one. Anyway, I'm sure you're eager to settle in. Try to keep the noise down. There's a good fella. Lando scuttled to the door, tongue slipping back and forth like a thirsty lizard. Adwam is your one sure, Zan. It's job, Han shouted uh, after the rapidly vanishing landlord. He moved to close the door, only to find it jammed with a pink shoe. The door swung open to reveal a rotund middle-aged lady dressed in a pink burlesque outfit, a hand held out. Patrice Pumpymore, at your service. I understand you were to be neighbours. News travels fast, mumbled Hans, limply shaking the woman's hand. A pleasure, I'm sure. I'm Hans, Hans Job. Patrice raised her eyebrows. Charms, I'm so glad to have a gentleman for a neighbour. The last tenant proved to be an uncouth lout. Never said a word, just played his flipping fiddle every night. I know you never heard such a racket. It came as no surprise, we know, when they found him. She stuck her tongue out and crossed her eyes, hand tugging at an imaginary noose. So you knew my brother? Madame Pompimore <laughs> clenched and uncrossed her eyes. Your brother? Yes, Eric was my half-brother. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please accept my condolences. Yes, of course. Now, if you're allowed to allow me to, of course, of course, if there's anything you need, I'm right across the hall. Anything, mind you. Hands pushed the door close to his inane grin, vanishing as it clicked shut. Fiddle player, he hissed. The outlandish burlesque costume screamed at the woman's lack of taste. How far had his brother fallen to have share, to share a building with such people? It made no sense. The last letter Eric sent, he'd been gushing about his magnum opus, a piece of music so divine 
as to serenade the gods. Hans looked at the scribbled address on the crumpled receipt. Where did you leave it, Eric? Where is your masterpiece? And there we are. And you want to know the rest? <laughs> And oh. Hans' job. Oh God! Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah, she couldn't so, keep yeah. it together when you, every time he had to say, "Man, bump me more." <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What, so, what yeah, other you what happens to Hans' job? You'll have to uh, get the book. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. In fact, I was just going to ask you, but actually, we'll, we'll put that to the group in a moment uh, about other comedy names that we've used. Um, <laughs> we'll put that to around the, the things that could be quite amusing, I think. Um, nice one, sir. <laughs> I'll bring you back on in a moment. I'm just going to do my little bit, and then, uh... righto. Uh, yeah, my my story is called "The Search for Rumpy Pumpy," uh, who is an aged nookie man, sir, and they're looking for his tomb. In the wild, in the wilds of Cornwall, uh, to start pretty much at the beginning, but um, just a little bit into it. Uh, Emma Royds, a mature student at Gropham University, uh, is has been summoned to the office of Doctor Roger Blocker. Um, so yeah, we'll pick it up there. You wanted to see me, Doctor? I did. He looked her up and down. Finally, realisation dawned. Oh, I did. Come in and stop messing about. Take a seat. Blocker strutted towards his desk with his scrawny chest puffed out and his buttocks clenched before sitting himself down with his legs crossed and his hands on his topmost knee. Emma shut the door behind her and sat in the chair opposite. What did you want to see me for, Doctor? She asked, putting on her posh voice and doing her best to bury her cockney twang. Mm, it's come to my attention, Miss Royds, that your work has been slipping of late. It has? It has, and it's my duty as head of the department to get to the bottom of what might be the problem. Emma squirmed in her seat. The trousers she had borrowed from V were far too tight for her. Blocker indicated the university crest on the wall behind his desk. Here at Gropeham University, we pride ourselves on being receptive to our students' needs. Hence our motto, to S in manibus, you are in safe hands. Blocker beamed with pride as Emma studied the crest with a look of amusement. The centre of it depicted two large shields side by side, with a hand cupping the bottom of each. Um, I didn't realise there was a problem with my work, Doctor. Really? Blocker leaned forward, his eyebrow cocked. Then how do you explain the fiasco with the goosing gorge skeleton the other morning? Emma blushed. She'd been doing her best to forget about that regrettable incident. Well, how was I to know the extra bone came from a separate specimen? Pouting petulantly, she folded her arms across her chest. But why didn't you ask your professor before fixing it where you did? It seemed like the logical place for it to go. Blocker gasped. <laughs> His mouth formed a perfect O. After a moment, he composed himself. It's clear to me that you are, how should I put it, distracted of late. Take a look at these sketches. Well, what are they? Emma asked haughtily. They're your anatomical sketches of what you think the goosing gorge man would look like. Emma reviewed her drawings. The figure was bipedal but hunched with elongated arms and a dog-like skull. I don't see what the problem is. The skull has definite canine attributes. I'm not talking about its head, Miss Royds. I'm referring to lower down. Blocker jabbed a bony finger towards the groinal area. It's grossly exaggerated. Poor Professor Stiff in the anthropology department nearly had to change his classification from Homo canis to Homo erectus gigantis. Under her tight blonde curls, Emma had turned as red as a beetroot. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor. I don't know what's come over me. I've been having these dreams, see? Dreams? Blocker raised an eyebrow. Yeah, every night. Mm, what about? Well, um, she trailed off, her nerves getting the better of her. Come on, you can tell me. I've been trained to deal with all manner of tentacles. Emma's hand shot up towards her mouth, but wasn't quick enough to stop the word from blurting out at extreme volume. What? 
Blocker gasped. Outrageous that a girl from a good family should be having those sorts of dreams. It's disgusting. Eh? I don't see what's so disgusting. Dreaming about a man's... No! She yelped, her voice going high and shrill enough to cut glass. Tentacles, Doctor, like a squid. Oh, I see. Blocker coughed nervously <laughs> and straightened his tie before deciding to cover his mistake. And and it's disgusting. Foul, slippery things. Ugh, can't stand the creatures. He paused to take a sip of water before continuing his line of questioning. Did anything happen to bring on these dreams? A trip to the aquarium or bad sushi, perhaps? Well, Emma shifted uncomfortably in her seat, desperately wishing she had worn her usual slacks. The first time was after Dr. Romper. She trailed off distractedly. Blocker bristled at the mention of his academic rival. If he'd lent any further over the desk, he'd have been lying on it. Go on. Dr. Romper did what exactly? Well, one night after everyone else had gone, yes, Blocker was salivating. This might be the juicy tidbit he'd been waiting for to finally get Richard Romper removed from campus. Oh, he showed it to me. Emma's shoulders heaved as she finally unburdened herself. Blocker gasped. Oh. He just pulled it out and plonked it on the workbench. Oh. Then what? Then he gave me a pair of rubber gloves and told me to be gentle. Right, that's it. Blocker launched into a flurry of activity, scribbling on a notebook and reaching for his black Bakelite telephone. He's gone too far this time. The board will have to listen to me now. As he started to dial, Emma cried out. Oh, Dr. Blocker, why did he have to show me the Nookie-nomicon? And we'll leave it there. <laughs> Righty-ho. So, let's bring them all back. Here's Callum. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. It's Ben and Chris. What ho, chaps. Oh. oh. Can, can I can I just say I've got a new character name from Chris's reading there that I thought was brilliant, Rusty Lock. <laughs> oh, nice. Rusty Lock. Rusty Rusty Lock. No, that's a good one, mate. That's a good one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so um all you people at home, if you want to get some questions into those people about the Nokinomicon or just about rude jokes in general, any anything, tentacles. Any question you like, get them down in the comments. Right, I'll start it off. We'll carry on on that theme. So, um, in our stories, we've all got comedy names, right? Um, so, I, in mine, I've got Emma Royds, um, <laughs> Betty Swallocks, uh, <laughs> uh, Drew Peacock. <laughs> <laughs> Genius. Genius. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's and obviously we've got the, the, the Nookie Mancer himself, Grumpy Pumpy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Callum, let's, let's hear some of your names from yours, mate. Well, I brought my list up actually, because I was <laughs> when you were talking about it yeah. from the page when we were organizing it. So mm. there was uh, oh. Professor C. Feely. Um yeah. <laughs> Should we do? Do you want to do who we imagined in the role, or just leave? If you want to, out? mate, yeah, yeah, go for it. So it was Professor yeah. C. Feely, I thought it was Frankie Howard. It was Professor okay. Armitage Shanks, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, Tig Bitties, <laughs> obviously. There was Anita Dick, Joan Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> now, Harry, I changed actually because there was a punchline I needed something different. So he started as um, Harry Ascrack. <laughs> and he became a paddy ball sack <laughs> for the purposes of a punchline. That would have been Charles Hawtrey. There's Dick yeah. Trickle, Sid James, obviously. Uh, Roger, Roger Rogers, <laughs> Bernard Breslow. Rogers. Nice. Professor Paddy Cake, Peter Butterworth, the Priestess Fenella, the fabulous Fenella. Oh, and yeah. obviously the great oh. bug bugger off that was uh, John Pertwee <laughs> with the list. <laughs> Oh, she's a goddess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was my lot. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Rob? Yeah, so I had uh, Colon the Barbarian was uh, <laughs> Jim Dell. Uh, Bernard Breslaw gets two roles. Well, the character has two names. is Nick Knack 
but is really undercover is a master thief called Nick Things. There's a uh, <laughs> Blue Sonia is Babs Windsor, not because of her hair colour, but because of her language. <laughs> the, the the wizard in the tower is Kenneth Williams, and his name is Utta Smut. Or Utta Smut. <laughs> And the toad god is Sid James, Sarg Nosha. So, <laughs> uh, Peter Butterworth and Jack Douglas have walk-on parts, and Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion plays himself. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Beth, we've already heard the footer books. <laughs> the footer books. Well, the thing is... Fanny. Fanny. Fa I was, the thing is, Fanny, here in the States, it... it doesn't mean the same thing that it means uh, in, in your neck of the woods. It's no, it's arse, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's and it's a very harmless word. It's like a casual word that that a mom might say about your about to a kid, you know. I'm yeah. gonna, you know, so <laughs> if you ever come to the states not. and hear some some woman saying, "I'm gonna smack you across the fanny," um, don't call <laughs> child protective services. It is we're just clueless Americans, and uh, so at Melvin is is a funny thing because I'm from. Uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, from the heart of Cajun country, and a Melvin is a very colloquial word for like uh, a wedgie. Um, so there was just a little, a little bit of local thing. Now, I mean, I only had had four characters: um, Lady Chatterley, of course. I was trying to think of your matronly, you know, the plump, buxom uh, type yeah, woman. Yeah, just, uh, you had and yeah. <laughs> exactly. But uh, but then uh, the one that was a little more that wasn't obvious until he gives his full name they are trying to find somebody to help them with their problems and they run across a, a paranormal uh, private investigator you know and she's sort of wondering does he what does he investigate besides privates but uh but anyway he says this he's a detective and his name is holmes and they're like oh holmes are you related to sherlock or mycroft you know are you sherlock are you mycroft holmes he's like no my name is john <laughs> there we go. Yeah, and so so John Holmes is uh, quite endowed in uh, in the uh, the arts of uh, private investigation. Oh, brilliant! Also known as the beer can, I believe. <laughs> Isn't that his billing? The beer can, John Holmes, <laughs> the real John yep. Holmes. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, Chris. Um. So we've done a few of them, hands job and uh <laughs> humpy more. Um the sextet that he puts together of a, a cast of characters. Um we've got uh oh the um yeah the cellist, which of uh Norma Stitz, classic classic nice. <laughs> yeah. name, um with her enormous cello. Um <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, who else we got? Oh, chap lips. <laughs> <laughs> He's like a jazz, jazz flutist. Nice. Um, oh, I'm trying to think what the others were now. Um, oh, Jack Horner, simply for the jokes about horns and corners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, oh, and Lee Vital, simply for an ongoing <laughs> joke about. <laughs> I was only asking. Nice, nice. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm not sure all my characters were actually, you know, true to the uh, carry on. Most of them were, but there were a couple of characters that didn't, that, where they didn't map on the carry on. Well, we can just say the one with some of the lesser known, you know, like your Peter Gilmore's or your, you know. Yeah, it was like that yeah. whole area, wasn't it? Really, it was that I'm sure they could dug some of those. Them up. <laughs> yeah, could have dug yeah. one of them up from somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Harry H. Oh. Corbett was only in one film, I think, wasn't he? Was he yeah, he was. Yeah, Harry on screaming, yeah. 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 And then obviously you had people like Bob Monkhouse in the early ones and yeah. Oh, yeah. people like yeah. that, you know. So yeah. Kenneth yeah. Connor. <laughs> Kenneth Connor. Well, he was in he was probably he was in, in most, I think. He was in quite a few, wasn't he? He was yeah. in the yeah, most. Pertwee wasn't in nearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pertwee wasn't. He was in no, he was I in what? Him. Four or five? Oh Fenella, how many was Fenella in? Was it only that one Two. screaming? Two. She was in was Regardless. Uh, was she? Yeah, she had a bit part in Regardless, playing a vamp who uh, hires somebody to get off with her to make her husband jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's Because that's one's more like a, a load of sketches, isn't it? Carry on Regardless. That's where you got Kenny it? taking the monkey on the bus and all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So actually, yeah, let's go with that, being as we're uh, we're talking about that. So what what sort of was your inspirations? What you know, we, we talked about a little bit, Rob, but we'll go into more detail now. So for me, I mean, mine uh, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I guess from the Lovecraftian end, it was sort of inspired by maybe Mountains and Madness a little bit, but more with the Clark Ashton Smith, really, with the, uh, you know, the Hyperborean Nookie Mancer, <laughs> Rob P. Pumpy. But um, the Carry On film, it was probably, probably Carry On Behind inspired <laughs> that the most, because I think that, for me, is an incredibly underrated one, because, I mean, it suffers from not having Sid in it. Uh, but Kenneth Williams in that with Elka Summer is just perfect with the uh, with all the, the jokes about the uh, the Roman Roman murals and it's a Venus. <laughs> 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 but if you see here, Professor, a huge Venus. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. So Callum, inspirations, mate. I don't know. I think on the Cthulhu side, I think it was more. Um... I think with the cult, I was still, I kept getting the image of um, I can't remember the name of it. You probably know better than me. The game that came out recently, um, uh, not very recently. Probably I'm saying recently. It's probably about ten years ago now. But the Xbox game that was out, uh, Call of Duty, yeah. possibly, and that was all kind of set in caves and underground. Yeah, and, yeah, dark corners of the earth. Yeah, Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. Yeah. yeah, so I was kind of thinking of that for that side. And I think for the other one was more like, um, I think because of the coach, because I, I intended, you know how it starts when you, you've got a load of ideas and then you're kind of hitting the, the word count so you can't do as much. <laughs> I intended a lot more on the coach. And that so that was like like carry on abroad and stuff like that. Like those yeah. where they're all trapped on the coach. I wanted a bit more there, but then... You kind of like, oh no, I've got no room for story now, so you have to kind of move it on a bit. <laughs> but it was that, it was that kind of carry on abroad kind of feeling. Yeah, I think with the the group. Yeah, David Green's was uh, obviously. Yeah, but ours turned out very, like with very similar characters. We had yeah, both had the had some nice parallels to have nice links to it. Yeah, because mm. his was very carry on abroad. Uh, we should mention the name of his because it cracks me up every time. It's uh, <laughs> Food's Company, Three's a Crowd, A Cult's a Blooming Gangbang. So <laughs> 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 like, you, seriously, you want me to use that? All right. <laughs> That's probably why he's not here. <laughs> yeah, but that was weird because we didn't really tell each other what we were doing, did we? We kind of... No got on with what we were doing we could we did things like the cast list and fun stuff like that yeah and then when i read david it was kind of like oh yeah we've gone very down the same path because we've taken bits of carry on screaming and bits of abroad i think you know with finella yeah. was moved into abroad basically <laughs> That's pretty much yeah 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 that's how i liked it though that they all kind of i, I like the way it kind of worked because it, we all did a sort of time so it was like this was not planned at all, but obviously, no. Rob's was back, you know, Hi Hyborian age <laughs> in the Hyborian <laughs> age, and then, and then we had stories in the twenties, and one a little bit later with Beths, and you know, and then, and and obviously um, Simone's as well, which is called Reanimator, yeah. <laughs> uh, which ends on such a marvelous, marvelous. Uh, uh, subversion of the Lovecraft of uh, the end of Medusa's Coil by Lovecraft, which is you know, it's one of those that you ugh, moments of Lovecraft's writing that you just kind of go, ugh. but she's <laughs> kind of turned it into something really funny and really cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what a reader. Um, and then obviously, yeah, you had you guys because you're yours and Dave sort of were around a similar sort of time, the mine was slightly yeah. later. And then Ella's is now, hers is called The Bone Room. <laughs> and it's about, you know, sex clubs uh, being me mixed up with cult meetings. <laughs> so, yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, master boner. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> I don't know, does, does your sex tent need a bone player? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> He's thinking about it. <laughs> Quite possibly. I've got I to say like that I left a lot of things on the field out there, you know. <laughs> yeah. 
I've got look, like I love the process of this because we could have sort of um, it kind of started out uh, of ridiculousness conversations of myself mm -hmm. and Callum and Chris and David. Um, and David's always called my work <coughs> Harry on Mendy's universe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it kind of went from there. And then we, when we was, were like, right, well, does it, should we just do it? <laughs> should we just do it? Um, we were sort of talking about it and uh, we put together the pack. And I've got to say, one of the funniest things about the whole setup was something that Mr. Hewitt created for the welcome pack. Uh, and here we go. Here it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. No, I didn't see that there. That's brilliment. That's one of the first things we did. I mean, that's how productive we were. <laughs> I literally spent weeks asking about like photoshopping carry on pictures with heads of deep ones and tentacles <laughs> and things like that just mucking about it's like i come up with this from carry on cowboy i changed this so we got the rumpo squid <laughs> <laughs> i've kept all this nonsense for a later date <laughs> <laughs> if we ever need a, if anybody ever asks us to do an illustrated making of but there you go, we're sorted. It's the DVD extras. Yeah, exactly. Easter eggs and stuff like that, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd like to have a blooper. Like, I've always wanted to do a book that had, uh, it's supposed to be like a blooper reel, but it's written. So it's like you replay the characters again, like somebody making an entrance, and all of a sudden your villain like stumbles over a table. You know, <laughs> uh, the main character forgets his line, and you hear you know, off page, the editor screaming, cut. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to have like a literary reel. That'd be interesting. I don't know how you do it, but that'd be really funny. Well, I just, <laughs> just take your most exciting scenes and just rewrite them, except that, that you know, the, you know, people are, are forgetting their lines and, and stumbling into things or, you know, all of a sudden a page falls down and it, it falls on page 69 and, and you know, the copy <laughs> editor is going, going, what the fuck, you guys? You know, just oh, to make it like a literary equivalent of a blooper reel. That's an interesting yeah. idea. I, I've always wanted to do that with a book. Oh, yeah. 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 That's good. That's yeah, good. I think if you have like a like a Teddy Pratchett type narrator who's kind of stood apart from it, you can kind of explain all of that quite easily, can't you? Then you have like yes. like with him, it's like all the footnotes and stuff like that, and then you can kind yeah. of, yeah. <laughs> kind of that'd bring work. Yeah, that'd yeah. work. Yeah, Nick and Nikki de Coister. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. I'm terrible with names. Uh, yeah, the best works come out of nonsensical conversations. Yeah, it's yeah. what would, yeah. you know, yeah. Callum, we were talking about uh, about poltergeese. Poltergeese. I was talking to Callum about, yeah, <laughs> on, on another, another book release, uh, I started telling the other writers about the incident with Fabio killing a goose with his face. And that turned into this idea that Callum and I have about, about, Geese and Fabio is the evil guy who's out to, to destroy the world, and the only way thing that can stop him are the geese. Yeah, we're um, definitely going to do something with it for House of Loki, definitely, aren't we? We just, at the minute, you know, they're busy with loads of other things, but we definitely are. We just, we just, it's one of those things, isn't it? When you get those ideas in, it's like, yeah, you just have to, we have to find but, a way to make this happen. <laughs> uh, well, I'm yeah. In, yeah, I'm in the area that, that I'm going to make a pilgrimage to the roller coaster. It's within driving distance. So sometimes <laughs> I'm going to go, you know, my friend and I are going to go and we're going to have a little stuffed geese and we're going to ride the roller coaster. <laughs> nice. Oh, fuck <laughs> Yeah, so the non the like the random things that always turn out to be like the the, the most fun things to work on. It's like I um I did the recently as well the Musketeers versus Cthulhu uh, <laughs> anthology, and that that was great fun. That was great fun. I'm gonna do a, I'm, I will be doing a launch party for that maybe next weekend as well at some point. But and uh, but you did another one, didn't you, Beth? Beth. Well, that came. You know, I, I it started with the versus series, and it's funny. You yeah. know, I have in the intro that how. It shouldn't surprise anybody, anyone who knows you, that you actually beat me to it to have the first book in the series. But it it came about. <laughs> it, it came up. It came about from a. The idea came about from a fever dream. First, as I mean, I was just whacked out on cold medicine several years ago, and I was just scribbling in my uh, in my notebook, trying to be productive anyway. And when I woke up, and I was the cold medicine had worn off and the fever had fallen, I realized I'd written unicorns versus clowns in hell, 
And, uh, <laughs> and, and last year, I was writing to Shelley and Brandy from Black Ink Fiction, and uh, I told them, you know, that, about this joke, and they said, oh, and Shelley just really quick whipped up a, a mock cover, Unicorns versus Clowns in Hell. And so uh, I posted it as an April Fool's joke, and I said, you know, just think of it, that would be an obvious joke, like deadline is April 2nd, so people say, oh, right, I remember what day it is. Mm -hmm. uh, minimum word count, 70,000. Author compensation, uh, Keith Richards, belly button lint. And, uh, <laughs> but so many people, so many people were disappointed that, um, that it, it wasn't a real thing, that I decided to, to make it a real thing. And um, uh, the deciding factor was my brother, who only writes fiction every now and again, said, I will write the shit out of that if you, if you post that. <laughs> He contributed two stories, and uh, so now it's it's a new now the versus thing is is gonna is gonna happen. So I just sent in all the edits uh, to Black Ink, and that that's coming out in July. But oh, yeah, yeah, that came from a, a fever dream and then a, uh, a an April Fool's joke. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah, there's another another one in the works, isn't there now? Like uh, the Loch Ness it? monster versus I forget, Ghost but but or something or go, yeah, the versus or... the Loch Ness. I think it's oh, Ghost versus Loch Ness Monster, but yeah. they had all these great ideas like vampires versus minotaurs on Broadway, and you know, just <laughs> I mean, they're, they're just it, it it just had me roll. I mean, they took this idea and they ran with it. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm, that I feel like my work on Earth is done. <laughs> this is it. You've got to look. You've got to love these ideas because I mean, it, it, when people are really into something, you get the sort of the best out of people, don't you? I mean, it's. I always find I'm working better if I'm really into what I'm writing. Of you know, course. If I'm, yeah. It, it was, um, for me, the sillier the idea, the better. It's like this. I mean, I ended up, my, I think mine came into like, just like, this kind of come as no surprise to anybody who knows me. <laughs> it came in as basically just under 10,000 words, I think. Uh, and uh, way over the limit as usual. Um, but who cares? Um, but it just felt like I'd written like a drabble. It just sort of happened, you know. It just, just spurted out. Your, your drabbles are usually about 10,000 fucking words as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> but don't you think, Tim, this is something we've spoken about quite a lot on the podcast, that Lovecraft was far more humorous than people give him credit for. Oh, totally. And the whole yeah. circle with this sharing back and forth of all these ideas, they were really... You know, they were killing each other in the stories and setting each other up. Oh, yeah. This kind of stuff. Giving each other ridiculous names. And, yeah. 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 <laughs> like, then, like Lovecraft's name for Frank Belknap Long always cracks me up. Chime Sleepius. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's great, isn't it? Like Two Gun Bob. It was uh, Robert yeah. E. Howard and all that. It's just, yeah. He was a lot more of a funny guy than, the, than you'd think. It was, it, actually, you, you were telling... Um, on the last thing we recorded, the last Clark Ashton Smith one, you told me that anecdote of uh, one of Clark Ashton Smith's lady friends who went to visit Lovecraft. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he took her to the uh, took her to the um, graveyard and started yeah. freaking her out <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for for a giggle, you know. <laughs> yeah, he started putting on this real vampiric voice and telling her this really creepy story, and she was quite. It was it was the daughter of Clark Ashton Smith's friend. So I guess she was probably 19, 20 or something. And um, she eventually, she got so scared, she ran out of the cemetery with Lovecraft chasing us, going, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which doesn't fit with the Lovecraft image at all, does it? But, you know, no, it's, that's, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah, uh, it's nice, isn't it, when you read these kind of stories? It's, uh, you've, I've, I've always found, like, horror and comedy just go so oh, well for me absolutely i mean bad taste <laughs> is one of the all-time great horror and comedy films and oh really, yeah you know totally. peter jackson that kind yeah. of stuff it, it just fits perfectly yeah but that was yeah. one of the things with this i mean when we were little uh, we used to have like a double bill and it'd be it'd be daytime as well you'd have like a carry-on film and then you'd be followed by like a hammer honor film yes you know, both yeah. you'd say well they're not really daytime things but you can get away because both never went too far did they you know like yeah. the innuendo in Carry On. If your kids get it, then it's too fucking late anyway. <laughs> but if, if they don't get it, then it's all perfectly innocent and silly. Doesn't yeah, they just laugh at the slapstick. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah that was natural, work, wasn't it? It was hard to have those two yeah. next to each other because it was something, you know, it was like Britain was proud of. And 
and kind of showcased oh, yeah. them at the weekend. I, I suppose in some ways those two were the, the sort of standard bearers for British film through the yeah, 60s, yeah, 70s, weren't so. they? They were the two big companies, I guess, really. Yeah, definitely. And and let's face it, Hammer is camp as all. It's as oh, camp to row a tents, isn't it? Let's yeah. face it. It's very it's high camp at its finest. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff at that time, the gothic stuff it was all a, a li- the british stuff anyway it was all a little bit camp it was all a little bit carry on in a way yeah, and, yeah, and even when they went a bit sexy it was always a bit yeah, yeah <laughs> it was all a bit <laughs> <laughs> lots of men in tweed going yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nikki says yeah she agrees like you need comedy to balance the horror even the most serious works like makes dark so much absolute yeah totally that's uh, something I've been I've said all along. I don't think I could write a hundred percent serious thing if I tried. It's like because I mean, you I mean you know yourselves if you injure yourself or something, your natural thing is to make a joke about it, or you you know or you, you know you see somebody injure themselves. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, you're going to laugh, and two minutes later, you'll be making a joke about it. You know, yeah. it's yeah. it's a coping mechanism anyway, isn't it? So in these situations, I find it more realistic sometimes that people do that. <laughs> Complete and total buffoons when their life are in danger. Because you're not thinking right anyway, are you? So, oh, it's a technical, you know. <laughs> and I think for me as, as well, it was that contrast with like this very sort of heroic sword and sorcery thing mm. with films like mm. Carry On Cleo. And I, I just picture Jim Dale, I'm sure there's films where he's sort of got a sword in front of him and he's sort of going like that. <laughs> yeah. And the other guy sort of runs onto it, you know? It, it's that sort of. It's that actually sort of Kenneth setup. Connor in Carry On Cleo. Because oh, it, right, right. obviously uh, Jim Dale's actually the one that can fight, Hengist but he's Pod. sidelined, isn't he? <laughs> he's yeah, left to, right. to the buffoon. Oh, and he, he gets the glory, which, which when yeah. you think about it, is probably how these legends begin, right? Achilles was probably a real idiot, but, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> happened and someone tripped over and banged his ankle and, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of story developed, <laughs> you know. Nice. <laughs> oh brilliant <laughs> this has just made me giggle uh john clue so looking at the early pictures of posting table should consider a limited edition pop-up book who uh, oh, yeah. the first thing they're gonna get rob's glistening shaft popping out of page one <laughs> the, the, the temple of the toad <laughs> that pays to advertise don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Have someone's eye out with that. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had to. I had because at the end in mine, I did because um, when they end up in the tube of Rumpy Bumpy, uh, there's the uh, there's all the like pictograms on the wall, and one of them I actually put in a little Easter egg of yours, Rob. I put the Tower of the Toad in, and the Sid James character, Doctor <laughs> Doctor Romper, is going. Oh, I'll make your eyes water. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't know. I, I think we should be angling for a Netflix series anyway. I don't know about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's something I'd really like to uh, like like to uh, mention uh, here is we, that we've actually got uh, the vocal talents of Mister uh, Mister uh, oh, Christopher wow. Brasini, uh, who did the he did the audio book of my uh, novella Spiffing, which is very similar kind of tone uh, to this. It, that's kind of like a carry on film meets. Um, Agatha Christie meets Lovecraft. Um, and he just nailed it. He did the voices and everything. So <laughs> I think he's going to have some real fun. You can get there. a sample as well, can't you, on the spiffing page? Yes, you can, yeah, on yes. the on the thing. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And he just, yeah, it's like the voices he did for like <laughs> for the, these these complete and total fops, these buffoons, these like PG Woodhouse characters, you know, so, oh, come <laughs> on, chaps. It's all like, yeah, he really went for it. So I'm really looking forward <laughs> to see what he does for this. So, yeah, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, hang on. We've got a question here from John. He uh, says, some great belly laughs in these. How long average did it take to write uh, each, each one of us? Did we go through many drafts or did layer easily? Um, <coughs> mine... Mine didn't take long to write at all. Uh, once it actually got going, because I had some other, I had, I, had, I, had, I knew what I was doing right at the beginning, but then I had some other stuff I needed to do first. And but once I got into it, it took me about a week, I think. And then, yeah, not much tinkering after that, really. Um, Callum, 
Oh, yeah, I think the actual writing of it was only a couple of days, really, for the yeah. the, the, the first thing. Um, uh, there was, like you, were in a hundred different projects, most of them with you, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. most of them were me, yeah. <laughs> All kinds of things going on. But then when I sat down, because for me, I just let the characters run in my head for a bit, um, and I'll have a vague idea of where the story's going. Then when I sit down, it just tells itself to me then. Yeah. Um, and with this, the characters... You already know you know exactly what they're going to do you don't have to worry about you just kind of get on with your story and you know exactly how they're all going to react quite easily so yeah it was quite quick really and then we did a second draft and then after everyone had had a look at each other's and stuff yeah but that was funny as well because we were supposed to look over each other's kind of work and stuff i just couldn't i was just crying laughing although i had to just keep putting it down and giggling to myself but that's when you're supposed to be helpful isn't it and say oh you know maybe do this or maybe it was just yeah it was a nightmare to edit (laughs) because i I wasn't paying any attention i was just (laughs) just (laughs) rob well obviously i've just ripped off Bob Howard to tear of the <laughs> elephant for the plot. So that was dead simple. Yeah. Um, once I'd had that idea, then it was just coming up with the names and pretty much running through the same story as it happens in the original, but adding those little embellishments in. Uh, probably the longest thing was was thinking up the names. And then we also had a sort of brainstorming session with my yeah. wife because um, at one point <laughs> he goes into a tavern uh, where they have the return of the king, Elvish greatest hits. There's a <laughs> there's an elf tribute singer, and we were trying to think of what sort of songs to be used. And my wife came up with the best one of all, which I eventually used: "Shake, Rattle, and Troll," which I thought was yeah. just, <laughs> just brilliant. So that kind of stuff actually took more time <laughs> than getting the plot together. Really. Yeah, I think I spent the most time on a pun. I think I agonised over a pond for like about two days. <laughs> it's like plain sailing. Yeah, but that's hard, isn't it? Because they kind yeah. of all been done, haven't they? Those kind of, kind of like, yeah, funny names and the kind of most puns. You kind of like, yeah, yeah. It's near impossible, isn't it? To find one that's never, no one else has come across before. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm trying, to, trying to do some, trying to do it, but in a in a different way. Yeah, I think that's why I was doing that. I think in the end, I just kind of went, I'll sod it, I'll just do it, do it how it should, how it was. <laughs> <laughs> sod it. <laughs> so, Beth? Mine, um, in a way, it, it practically wrote itself. And yeah. uh, as usual, I, I was on the road. It's Things are getting, are drying up for me in New Orleans, so I have to spend more and more time uh, on the road. But uh, I managed to, to, <clears throat> to get, to tear one off fairly quickly. Um, I already had this sort of pre-existing idea uh, before before Tim approached me uh, because I'd been, been doing a lot of traveling and had stayed with somebody who was a lovely hostess and she never shut the fuck up. Uh, and it was almost like traumatic to my mind because I, I could get overstimulated really quickly. And I found myself just zoning out uh, and I thought I thought this would be a good uh, a good template for some sort of story because, as she's zoning out, I'm trying to think of anything that's much that's more pleasant than what she has to say, and I'm trying to be polite. Uh, and you know, I was like, "Come on, think of, of you know, think of, of something more pleasant than this, like Eldritch Horrors from the Deep." Uh, but she would just kind of natter about her job and all these coworkers that I'm already supposed to know who they are. And so I'd, 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 I'd kind of zone out and come back. She's talking about her little dog, and then I'd zone out. She's talking about her pedicure, and I'd zone out. And she's talking about her grandchildren. And Zone out. So I imagined what, that that the soporific effect that this has on people, and you know, because she sort of put me in a trance, and I thought, what if that? Uh, so I already kind of had this idea, and then so it was a good way to just, you know, exercise that demon, so to speak. Because by the time I started working on this on this story, it was fresh in my mind. You know, my brain was still lit up with the no, make it stop. <laughs> so, bam! It was like it was right there about. There was there was my thing that because uh, I was like maybe she just that's how she breathes is that uh, she doesn't have to take a breath because she's got mouths she's got a hole in the top of her head and mouths all over her body and she's a shoggoth. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> it just explains it all, doesn't it? It's simple when you yeah. think about it. <laughs> yeah. So next time I meet one of them people because we all meet them all the time. I yeah. usually when I'm on a bus. 
It's one of them <laughs> next to me. It's like the, the Jasper <laughs> Carrot, the, the Jasper Carrot uh, routine about the nutter on the bus. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Classic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jasper. <laughs> what always Jasper Carrot. <laughs> I love Jasper. Um, our family parrot is called Jasper. Jasper parrot. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. I love it. I didn't name it. Love it. <laughs> I didn't name it. I love it though. Yeah, no, same. <laughs> Chris, um, the story Jaws is kind of a direct sequel, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So the story yeah. kind of almost wrote itself in the sense um, that was fairly quick, probably a couple of hours of thinking about it. Um, and get it down. But the thing that took me all the time was trying to find the correct or the, the uh, collection. Who was in the sextet? What was the collection of the instruments that would deliver the biggest double on ah. <laughs> <laughs> The most apocalyptic, soul shattering. I, I, I still feel like I didn't quite nail it. You know, should I have gone with a, you know, a violinist or something? Would it be, a bassoon. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I, I reworked oh, no. that a few oh, times, no. just dropping different, <laughs> different, um, different instruments in, should we say, or different. Uh, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> whipping your instrument in and out. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> in and out. So yeah, it, all in all, probably a couple of days, um, um, three or four days. And most of that was spent researching the um, instruments. Um, mm. Various <laughs> terms are used with de various instruments to uh, see which ones could be repurposed. <laughs> you can always find some fingering if you get it. Yeah, exactly. Do <laughs> 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 well, you know that? Uh, you know what? I, guess, I, don't, I don't think I got that one. No one's going to mention the pink hobo. Are <laughs> 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 oh, God. How did I not get fingering in? Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> You should have put that in the edit notes, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I was too busy pissing myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, so, right. Uh, we'll stop wrapping this up now. Uh, yeah, so it's out. To, the Nookie Nobicon is out now. Uh, in the links, I, I put a, a godless link in there and an Amazon <coughs> link, and I think somebody else has put a godless link in there as well. Nice one. Thank you, Drew. Um, also, um, Peter Blakey Novis from Red Cape has just posted up the, um, a review that we've just had. Um, so that's in the comments. Uh, it's oh. brilliant. Uh, I'll put it up, but it's, it's quite long, and I think it'll take up the entire page. There we go. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's there, it's there below if you want to have a read. Uh, yeah, that, so that's out now. Um, I Hopefully the paperback is live now. It wasn't live um, just before I came on, but it should be any time. You know what Amazon's like now sometimes. You know, yeah, they're, like... very, they're very slow at the moment, I'd say, with books. I think mm. I waited about seven days for a, for a book. Yeah, uh, and that was on a prime thing, so I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, no, they they have been stunningly crap at the moment. It's got to be said. Yeah, um, they've been a nightmare with the Loki book as well. I think we just, but not getting any answers either. So you just like, <laughs> yeah, it took them like about three days to get back to me on a query on the Author Central thing the other day as well. Mm. Before they usually is usually it was in the hour. But it was just like <laughs> sitting there tapping for any time soon, chaps. Yeah, know. but it makes you look bad, doesn't it? It's like if you're yeah. either the publisher or the the um, group leader or whatever. Yeah. People are looking to you and it's like, well. I don't know. <laughs> when they pull the finger out. But anyway, yeah, it should be good. It should be live sort of now-ish, whenever, whenever it appears. Uh, but there will also be, like we keep saying, there will be a nice hard copy. So uh, I've got to get me uh, get my hands on one of those, you know. <laughs> is it shiny? <laughs> it is if you polish it, yeah. <laughs> uh, polish oh. it behind the door. <laughs> I can't come out. I've got to polish my nookie There are volumes and volumes of stories to come. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Excellent. Right. So uh, before we go, if you want to, does any want to tell us anything you've got going on at the minute or coming out? Anything at the moment, Callum? Uh, well, I've got a few adult things that I've worked on. Some, I think, with you still. To Probably. Out. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, a few adult things. So I'm kind of focusing on uh, stories for young people and House of yep. Loki stuff. So, and then there'll be like adult things that I've already done kind of drifting out over the next few months. So. Rob, and and I assume a sequel to this at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up for it. <laughs> so I'm up for it. Sorry, <laughs> I'm always up for it, sir. So. Oh, no. <laughs> right, I've read Rob. on the toilet walls. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. <laughs> but they had photos. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who that was climbing on the right. drain pipe. <laughs> 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 so, so, Rob, what are you working on at the minute, mate? Uh, I think the main thing is the podcast, as you mentioned at the start, yes. the Innsmouth Book Club. And mm -hmm. we're now running that alongside Strange Shadows, the Clark mm -hmm. Ashton Smith podcast. Uh, I think we've got four anthologies out now through Innsmouth Gold. And uh, there's going to be some more anthologies and a couple more sor sorcery books, hopefully coming out this year. Uh, so you can see news of all of that at uh, innsmouthgold.com. There's links there to, to pretty much everything. Perfect. Yeah. Beth? Uh, well, I mentioned uh, Unicorns versus Clowns in Hell. That'll be coming out in July. Uh, and um, got a couple of things. Any day now, I've got a, a charity anthology that's going to Dog Rescue, uh, called the Ludlow uh, Charity Anthologies for a dog rescue place in Chicago. And I've done a parody of uh, a ballad called Alan Tyne of Harrow, uh, that's the original, this is called Buddy Pit of Cotter, about a dog that uh, that uh, serves in the military, and, and the, it's, it's supposed to be a, a, a cute uh, little spoof. Um, I'm sort of paring down my uh, my anthologies to, to focus on the novels that I still haven't finished. Um, yes, working, on new, <laughs> we're working on a new record uh, with my friend Sean Healy, who's got a full band project, so it's going to be a lot of Irish and Scottish music. Nice. So that'll be out um, probably late this year, early next year. Awesome. Chris, what are you up to at the minute, mate? Uh, yeah, working on a lot of stuff that's not going to see the light of day for a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, the, this that you put me onto last year. So oh, all yeah. The kids, all the kids watching oh, Stranger I Things. Get in it. <laughs> I got who Pete Bush woman is. <laughs> so, I went way out. I went off on one, and they were like, that's not quite what we were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> so, bollocks. Uh, yeah, so um, talk about good timing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, no, nice one, Pete man. Bush from, um, was it Deadhead? Deadhead, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm glad. Um, yeah. Because I put you on to it because we're both fans, aren't we? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, that was last yeah. year sometime, wasn't it? So, um, yeah, um, that's pretty much the only thing I've got out at the moment. And then nice. there's a few other things that will break cover at some point, yeah. as they usually do. Yeah, well, as and when. As yeah. and when it's, uh, it's like um, quite recently a book came out um, that I had stories accepted for in 2019. <laughs> like the beginning of 2019, they're like some of the earliest things I ever had, yeah, yeah. right? Wow. And, I, and I, I'd completely forgotten about it, <laughs> it disappeared. I was like, Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, strange out that like some things come out quickly and others don't, and yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's strange. Well, this year you I've been trying does. not to do the running around getting into every anthology and just cherry pick the odd ones. Yeah, <laughs> the, that's the yeah. I'm, I'm trying to do the same. I'm I'm really winding it like like Beth said. I'm winding it down. Like uh, I'm not t I'm not tending to do open submissions. I'm only tending to do invited calls yeah. mm -hmm. at the moment because I've just got so much other crap that I need to actually finish. It's difficult. Uh, it's difficult yeah. seeing all these anthologies. Think, oh, I really want to have crap. I'm not. Looking, I'm working. intentionally not looking on things like yeah, 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 yeah. I'm yeah. intentionally not looking. <laughs> Yeah, you end up like working a full time job in the projects, don't you? Because you kind of, yeah, I, yeah. I can't say no to anything. <laughs> Not really. No, we know. <laughs> no, but you do, don't you? It's like it's like you've got, and you're thinking, well, I want to write that novel myself, and I want to write this yeah, novel, yeah. I think. And for me, like writing for young people as well, you're like, I can't. I'm tied into about twenty different projects for the last two years. <laughs> yeah, it's madness, isn't it? Right then. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for all coming on, people. Uh, it, was, it was great fun, as, as we thought it would be. <laughs> and uh, thank you, all you people at home, to, for tuning in. Like I say, it's out now. Links are below. 
If you're watching on YouTube, uh, hit subscribe, and the links will be below um, below the video in the information. Uh, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Tim. We'll see you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So, why? Why? Bye bye. I hate that. Bye. Toodaloo.